Today's show is all about this absolutely massive BenQ 31 and a half inch 4K monitor. Now, how the hell do I get out of this thing? Well, welcome. Howdy. Welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photo Joseph, where we talk about all kinds of things, photography, video, live streaming, and otherwise related. Today we're talking about this. It, it's, it's like my co-pilot today has taken up half of the stage. So this, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to do this. This is huge. This is a monitor from a company called BenQ. It is a 31 and a half inch 4K, that's ultra HD, display. It has HDR, it has multiple inputs, it's got a bunch of really cool features that I think you guys are going to enjoy. It's, uh, it's pretty sweet. So let me, if you've ever used a really big display before, uh, you can appreciate just how big something like this really is. But just as a point of comparison, I know that Apple, for, for those Apple users out there, Apple made a display once that was 30 inches. Here, we, I've got it right here. This was the old Apple 30 inch display. It was, it was big. It was it was noticeably, I mean, it was like, whoa, that was the biggest dang thing. But look at, look at the resolution. It was only 2560 by 1600, which let's admit at the time was, whoa, that was insanely huge. But, um, but then it got bigger, right? And actually before, before this, you know, Apple went smaller. Now, Apple went down to a 27 inch display, the, the 5K, I'm, well, even before the 5K iMac, the 27 inch iMac, that was the standard. That was the biggest screen you could buy. That 30 inch display, that 30, where it is, that 30 inch display stopped being made. Uh, so that was kind of disappointing for those who really like a big display. Granted, the iMac display was a higher resolution, and then you get the 5K iMac, which is even higher resolution, and retina display, and so on and so on. But you know, for those of us who like the really big display, we kind of missed it. Kind of missed it. When we look at what we're doing today in comparison, this one is a 31 and a half inch display at 38 by 40 by 2160. So full 4K, true 4K Ultra HD resolution. Now here's one of the things about running at that high of resolution. Even at this size of a screen, it's too, everything's too small. Everything really does become too small. And I've seen this before on smaller 4K monitors. I actually have a, I think, 23 or 24 inch 4K display. You absolutely, you can't run it at 4K. It's impossible, like everything's microscopic on there. Now I think on Windows, you have the ability to scale pretty much everything in the UI. I, I can't say that with total confidence, I'm not a Windows user, but I'm pretty sure you can. On macOS, you have less flexibility with scaling the UI. So while there are some things you can scale, like the font size and the finder, you will very quickly find that there are things that just aren't, that are just too small. Or like running in Photoshop, for example. Photoshop, you've got all these little bits of text on there, or Lightroom has little bits of text, and it can be really hard to read. And when I first started using it, I was honestly feeling like I'm like my eyes are starting to hurt. This is too small. And I didn't want to scale the resolution because we all know that if you scale the resolution of a monitor, it drops in quality. But at one point I went, you know, I'm just giving up on this. I've got to, I've got to try it. And you know what? It actually works really, really well. So on the Mac, if you go into the display settings, you can see this, so this is just a screenshot of my display settings, but you can see the standard size on the right where it says more space, that's where you would normally be. But then step down from that, and you can see the circled red thing, it says looks like 3360 by 1890. So it is appearing to be a lower resolution, but everything gets a bit bigger. And putting this right next to my 5K iMac, because that's how I'm writing this, it's running as a secondary display to the 5K iMac, then everything becomes essentially the same size. This is still, this is like a little bit smaller than what's on the 5K iMac. But if you take a look at this, this is the display setup of the two side by side. That's what they look like. So the 5K iMac on the left, the BenQ on the right, the BenQ is the bigger one, and it is physically larger. And the resolution is very, very, very close. So that became the way that I wanted, or that I ran this thing. It was really good to have that resolution pretty much matching what was on the screen next to it. Things weren't smaller on one, bigger on the other. And it was big enough that my eyes weren't hurting anymore. Now, you know, I'm no spring chicken. So obviously if you're younger, better eyes, maybe it's a little bit easier. You don't mind looking at the teeny tiny fonts, but for me, it was getting to be too much. Uh, one of the other things, and I've already talked about this a bit, we'll talk about it more later too, is color calibration. In the process of doing that, I found that bringing the brightness down on the screen helped tremendously. I work in a relatively dark room, so if you find that your eyes are hurting when you're looking at the screen like this, or any screen, honestly, uh, consider lowering the brightness as well. That can definitely help. So let's talk a little bit more about this thing and get this out of my way right here. So uh, first of all, we've got these shades on here, and this is really quite cool. You have these shades 
that block any light reflections from hitting it. So if you're doing color critical work, you don't want any glare on the screen, even though it's a matte screen, it's not shiny like your iMac screen. It does a great job of knocking back reflections, but still you don't want anything glaring on it. That's what this is for. So this cover just comes on and off and it's actually in pieces. I'm just gonna get rid of it right now so I can move this thing around a little bit easier. And it comes with additional pieces, extra little pieces here, because one of the things you can do with this, get rid of some of these parts here, is check this out. You can rotate it vertically. Now I realize at this point you can't even see the top of it, but this does a full vertical rotation. And so then these additional parts in here allow you to use that cover to wrap it this way. So if you are doing a, imagine this, you're doing a studio shoot, you're doing a product shoot, you're doing, I don't know, fashion photography or something, and you've got the client in the studio and you're shooting tether, so things come up on the big screen. If you're shooting portrait photos all the time, why not put this thing in portrait orientation? You've got your laptop hooked up to this, you've got Lightroom or whatever you're tethering into, going into this and it's loading the image full screen on here as you're shooting it. Ha, huh, that's pretty awesome, pretty fantastic. Or if you're just doing massive vertical spreadsheets, you can definitely huge, right? So you got that option. So as you saw, it does tilt and rotate. So you got your full tilt right there. You got your rotate 90 degree rotate. And um, you got that capability in there. Tilts and lowers on there. It also pivots. There you go. So you know, full, full motion, full rotation. The stand is heavy, which is good. That's what you want, right? You don't want this thing to move when you're moving it. So that stand will totally stay in place. When I go to move this thing around, it is a beast to move. Well, it actually has a handle on the back, which is awesome. Let me get rid of this other stuff so I don't break anything here. And it is, uh, it is robust. It is not something that feels cheaply made in the slightest. This is definitely a, a honking, honking display. Let's talk about inputs. It has three inputs on it. You've got a HDMI mini display and what is it, micro display? No, mini display port and mini display port. So HDMI display port and mini display port. All three of them in the back here. You can actually run this in a picture in picture or side by side view, which is kind of cool. Now, I say it's kind of cool in the sense that if you want to, if you're running picture in picture, say so you have a totally separate computer that you want to have monitoring in there, that is obviously covering part of your main screen. So I'm not so sure how terribly useful that is. You can position it wherever you want using the on-screen displays. You can move it wherever you want. Not, I'm not a huge fan of the picture in picture thing. And then you've got picture by picture where it basically puts the two side by side, but then you end up with a display where, can you, see, you can see enough, you've got huge black bars across the top and bottom and two 16 by nine displays side by side. So, not terribly useful. I guess there might be times where that becomes handy, but for me at least, mainly the ability to simply switch inputs, go from input A, B to C, uh, that's really useful. So if you want to have a secondary computer hooked up to it, maybe you're doing the kind of work where you've got one computer that you use exclusively for your production work, your video process, your video editing, whatever, and you got another one that's doing your email and web browsing, that sort of thing. To be able to swap between them, that's pretty cool. You can use the uh, on-screen displays to toggle that. Now, I, I do wish that it was a little bit easier to do that. So you have this thing here that's called a hotkey puck like hockey puck, but with the extra T in there, the hot key puck. And this has, let's get a close-up look at this. I'm trying to get this thing out of the way here so I don't knock anything over. Let's see, if we go in for the close-up here, you can see this little display. It's uh, each one of these numbers, one, two, three, are programmable. You push that and it's a one button access to different things in there. And then there's the OK button, brings up the menu, full navigation, and then a return to get you out of this space. So those three buttons, the one, two, three, can be programmed. I wish they could be programmed to switch the input. Say, number one is my HDMI port, number two is my display port. It doesn't. And I'm hoping that's something that could actually be done via firmware, because that would make switching so much easier and quicker. Right now, you have to go into the input menu, navigate over, and you can make the, the input menu a one push, call, call up, call up, but then you still have to navigate over to the other choice and choose it. So it's a few clicks, and you're using these buttons on the front here. You can see these guys here. These are actually programmable as well. So you could program one of them to be the input selector, but it brings up the input selector, and then you still have to navigate over and choose it. So not quite as slick and easy as I would like it to be. Um, but what you can program these to do, and this is one of the really cool things about this monitor, is to change color spaces. So first of all, it supports Adobe RGB, which is awesome. It also has sRGB. It also has a black and white mode, which is very interesting. So if you're doing black and white photography editing, you want to have no color cast coming through, regardless of your color calibration. You can do that, and you get a total black and white image. Really, really cool. And then it has something that I was really excited about, and I was really hoping it was going to work the way I wanted it to, but it doesn't, and this is not BenQ's fault. This is just a hardware in the industry supported thing, but it has an HDR mode. Now, 
It's a 10-bit display with HDR. And what that means is if you can feed in a native HDR signal, you're going to see full HDR on here. Unfortunately, your Mac, and I, Windows World, I have no idea, but I seriously doubt that you can do this on Windows given the cost of hardware adding to anything else, um, without you know natively at least, um, you cannot output a HDR signal to this display. So if I take my iMac, if I new Mac Pro, a new iMac Pro, a brand new MacBook Retina, and plug it into here, I'm not going to get an HDR signal out. It doesn't work. So if you're editing in Final Cut Pro, and you're editing HDR, with, which of course Final Cut can do, and you're hoping to see an HDR image on screen, on the timeline, you can't do it that way. You still have to route it through an external box. You have to route it through an Aja box or Blackmagic box, each of which cost around $2,000 to $2,500, and that will give you your HDR output, which you then can feed into here. Because those boxes are so expensive, and I have not, um, have not found the justification to purchase one yet. Um, I was not able to test the true HDR capabilities of the monitor, which is really a shame because that's actually why it took me so long to do this review because I've been trying to figure out a way to get HDR into there without having to spend that kind of money, and it just it just hasn't happened. So unfortunately, that is not the case. If I ever get my hands on one of those, I will certainly let you know how that turned out. But I expect it to be quite good, and I've looked at other reviews online talking about it being quite good, but um, unfortunately, I can't vouch for that. If you do switch it into HDR mode and you're not sending it a full HDR, a true HDR signal, it'll actually tell you. It pops up a display on there and it says HDR native, I believe it says, if it's getting a native signal, and then it'll say HDR simulated or something like that if it's not. And the simulated is kind of kind of pointless. Now, if you're using it for something like gaming, if you've got a machine that puts out HDR or a, uh, I don't know, maybe even a DVD player, if you have a Blu-ray Blu DVD player, that does, and that's HD. Is there 4K? Anyway, if you've got a display, a, a piece of hardware that does true HDR out, you can plug it into here, and you're good to go. Ryan's telling me the PS4 Pro apparently does HDR out. So there you go. If you've got a PS4 Pro, you can plug that into one of the inputs there, and you've got one heck of a gaming monitor. Not too bad, not too shabby, right? Uh, let's see, what else has this thing got? So we talked about the hot key, hot key puck. We talked about the rotation. Let's take a look at the inputs here. I'm just going to swing this around to show you. So you do have on the side here, actually, you can, you can probably do it like this. So you have on here two USB ports, which means there is a USB input on the back as well. So you can take a standard uh, you know, USB cable like so from your Mac and go from your Mac out or your PC out to here. This goes into the monitor, and then you get two extra ports on here. So that's nice. You have just two, uh, two USB ports on the side of that. And you can see an SD card reader built into that as well. So that's kind of handy. You know, if you... Uh, if you want to use this as your primary display, you don't want to invest in a separate SD card reader. If you're not you know, doing big time photography full time, then you could probably get away with that and that'll be all right. So obviously it's not going to be a super fast reader, but it's just a built-in stock one. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's huge, as you can see. It is a very nice complement to, um, to the 5K iMac. And, um, and it's just an amazing thing to be staring at all day long. Now, I want to talk about color calibration, but before we do that, I want to remind you of how we operate on this show. We operate on what we call a value for value proposition. What that means is if you feel like you have gained value from today's show, then we would most certainly appreciate it if you consider putting a little bit of value back. Head to photojoseph.com support. Lots of different ways to support the show. One of the best ways, two of the best ways, are either by membership, Membership at photojoseph.com gets you all kinds of extra goodies. I'll let you read all about that on that support page. And then, of course, shopping in the affiliate store. If you decide you want to buy one of these things, we have links down below, link on the support page, links everywhere. If you want to buy one of these things, do me a favor and use my link. That's how, that's one of the ways that we make money on this show and helps to keep us on the air. So I'd appreciate that. So uh, let's go into the color calibration. So this has its own built-in color calibration, and it supports, this is just a screenshot of the color calibration tool. It's called Palette Master Element, and it supports the spider calibration tools as well as the x right calibration tools. So you can take either one of those bits of hardware, plug it in, drop it over here, and do the calibration. In fact, this is kind of cool when you're using the, um, the cover over it, the shields. It has a little window in here, so you can, when this is on, you can drop the calibration tool through there to do your calibration. Now, I've shown before, I did a video, uh, a show before on the Spider 5 calibration tool. We'll link to that up here. I talked about how it works, and I talked about calibrating this display with my iMac next to it and how remarkably close they got. And I also talked about how I felt like it was a little bit warm. It felt too warm to me, but this was what was, according to the hardware, this was accurate. And people had said that once they calibrated, pretty much everybody when they calibrate, like it feels warm in the beginning, just because you're not used to it, you're used to it being so cold. And so I've gotten used to it, and it, uh, it definitely doesn't feel as warm as it did before, but I always still felt like, eh, maybe it's a little bit warm. So I used this calibration tool, and it recalibrated it, and it felt 
right to me. It was definitely cooler, and that felt right. I'm looking at the white going, now that actually feels like white. So that was exciting, except that it didn't do a brightness calibration. Now, one of the things about the Spider, when you're using its own software, when you first do a calibration, it measures the ambient light in your room, and then it makes a recommended brightness setting for the monitor. That way, you are not looking at a screen that is too bright or too dark for your environment, because that matters. The built-in tool into this hardware doesn't do that. It lets you choose a brightness level, but that's arbitrary. I can say I want a brighter, want a darker, calibrate off of this, but that doesn't actually calibrate it for the room. So that's potentially a problem, not a huge issue, right? I mean, you can certainly bring it down to a level you're comfortable with and, and go for it from there. The real problem, though, was that even though the software says that it would calibrate my iMac, it shows the display, it shows the iMac in the display drop down. When I select it, it automatically moves the interface over to the iMac. You click the Start button, and nothing happens. I cannot get it to do anything on the iMac screen. Drag it back over to this screen, run it, runs perfectly fine. Put it on the iMac, it doesn't do anything. So using its own internal software, it was not possible, for me at least, and I'd love to know if anybody's got a, a way around this or figured something out about how to make it work, but I could not get it to calibrate the iMac screen, which means I'm back to the Spider software. So the Spider software works on both perfectly fine. It makes them match virtually identically. They look fantastic. So that's what I'm relying on now is the Spider software, uh, even though it is, does feel a little bit warmer. And you know, I might do some more tweaks in the Spider software, trying to make it just a little bit cooler, just because I'm yeah, I just feel like it should be. But um, but it works. It does what it's supposed to do. So that let's see, was there something else I wanted to share? And if that was everything there. So that, my friends, is that. One thing I realized is we haven't actually talked about the price of this thing yet, have we? Why don't we do that? Let me pull it up here on the B&H page that I've got. It comes in at $1,500, which isn't cheap, but honestly, that's not bad. Given the size of it, given the resolution of it, given how good of a quality it is, I think this is a really fair price for this display. If you are in the business of staring at your screen all day long to do photography or video editing, having something this huge and this color accurate and this just beautiful to look at, it's kind of nice. It's a lot of money. You could buy a whole lower end computer for that. But if you're pairing this up with a high end iMac, a Mac Pro, even, use, even using it with your MacBook Pro, if you've got a top spec MacBook Pro and you want to plug that into here and have that big display when you're at your desk, you know, you could, do, you could certainly do worse. Um, I've enjoyed looking at it. I've enjoyed working with it this much time. Um, it is a beautiful thing. So thank you, Ben Q, for sending this thing out for review. I'm stoked with it. It is definitely a high quality display, and I will absolutely give it a thumbs up. Um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous piece of gear. So that, my friends, is everything I wanted to tell you about that. If you've got any questions, you know what to do. Stick them into the live chat. For those of you who are watching live, if you're not watching live, you can put them in the comments down below. But we are going to jump over to a Q&A portion of the show right now.